Sean O'Malley came out and he said, I will never make the mistake that Connor made. This was the headline. Clickbait. Got me. I clicked. So he was talking about, he furthered the thought to just say, so many guys let it get personal. Connor never let it get personal. It was always competition. It was always business. But the Khabib fight, he let that get personal and it ate at him and I won't ever do that. These guys are insulting me. I'm insulting them. They got short man complex. I can't remember the athletes he was talking about. Uh, Henry and Peter Yon and, and Cody Garbrandt, I believe, were the three. And uh, you know, so, so they're angry. I'm never going to get angry. Okay. Well, let's break down what Sean's saying. Because first off, you want as an athlete to do whatever is best for you. And there's not a whole lot of broad strokes, right? You're always going to hear buzzwords. Coaches are always going to talk to you with buzzwords. You must. And then fill in the blank. You must sacrifice. You must be dedicated. You must be hungry. You must work hard. You're going to hear all of these buzzwords that you've heard since you were a little kid, and they're never going to go away. But the truth in sport is you only must do one thing to win. You must have more points than the other guy when time runs out. The end. There is absolutely nothing else in any sport that you must do to win, except have more points than the other guy when time runs out. So then you have to wonder, okay, how do I operate? What makes me tick? What keeps me motivated? What keeps me focused? Do I do my best work when I'm motivated and I'm focused? And the answer may be no, by the way. So when Sean's talking about that he's not going to let it get personal for him, he's reflecting inwardly what bothers him before a match. He's also representing that he does better with the calm. Well, then great. As a young man, he's 26 years old, as young as he is, if he is already in a position that he can identify what it is that makes him tick, it's such a tremendous advantage, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the other guy has to do it the same way. Mirko Krokop was a real anomaly within the sport when he was competing, particularly at the time that he was competing, because he was so stoic. He was so calm. Nobody could be calm going into this kind of an atmosphere. And there was a time in this world where your most experienced athlete still didn't have any experience. If you met a guy that had done mixed martial arts seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times, oh my goodness, that guy was an anomaly. You ever met a guy that had 20 of these matches? You're scratching your head and going, is that record even real? There just wasn't enough places to compete. There was no gym that you could go to when this sport started and all the way up until about 2001 that did mixed martial arts. It was still a situation where you were mixing martial arts. A karate guy would just train karate and get in there with a judo guy when the competition came around. And then you get the really smart guys that's gonna go practice karate, but he's also gonna go wrestle twice a week. But that's what it was. There was nothing all under one roof that you could do. And the only reason I offer that to you is you are gonna see different athletes at different times that do different things. You're gonna have your Dennis Rodmans and your John Joneses of the world where hard work and discipline and focus is the last thing that they need. My father was a horseman. He was very good, very good breeder. During his life, he was given breeder of the year, but even post-mortem for horses that he had that were babies at the time and grew up and made it to the track, he won the award again and wasn't even alive, but he was very good. And he got a call one day, got a call from a trainer named Tex Irwin. And Tex says, uh, hey, you got you to gotta claim this horse. He's racing on Saturday. You got to get down to Portland Meadows. You got to claim this horse. His name is Sunvest and you got to bring him to me. Only I know how to train this horse. No one else knows how to. So my dad looks the horse up and goes, man, his best days were behind him. He used to win a bunch of races. He hasn't won a race in over a year. And Tex Irwin said, yeah, that's because I used to train him. My dad goes, well, what's the secret? I'll go buy this horse because I trust you. But what is the secret? And Tex said, the secret on training this horse is you don't train him. You walk him every morning at 6 a.m. You walk him around the track. All the other horses are galloping and they're sprinting and they're running. This horse, you just walk him around the track. You bring him out on Sunday. You make sure he's fresh. He'll win the race. Oh, my goodness. That, that was anti-everything anybody knows about training. And animals aren't any different than humans, right? The one that works harder and eats better and sleeps more and is better taken care of generally has better results. So my dad buys the horse, gives it to Tex to train. Horse wins five races in a row which ties the track record 
goes for the track record, makes the front page of our state newspaper, SunVest, on there, goes for the record, loses in a photo finish, comes in second, comes back, wins three more races, gets claimed by somebody else, never wins again. Tex knew something about this specific horse, and this specific horse broke all of the rules, all of the buzzwords, none of them applied. He was a guy that showed up, and I'm talking about Sunvest the horse. He was a guy that showed up on game day and just knew how to play. He had a clear mind. He had a fresh body. Believed he could win. They'd walk around the track. It seemed that he knew where that finish line was. I mean, it seemed that way. Very hard to actually imagine a horse knew where it was, but I swear to goodness, even in the photo finish, he was reaching his nose out. He was reaching his nose at the very end to get across the line. So not every athlete is the same, but I do think what Sean O'Malley is saying where he looked at Connor and said, Connor kept it calm, he kept it professional, he kept it business until he did it. As soon as it became personal, got tired a little bit faster, affected the outcome, affected the way he looked at it, I'm not going to let that do. I've identified for me what makes me at my best. I like to work hard. I like to have some fun. I like to call some guys out. I like to get big fights. I like to prepare with my same team the same way, and I like to walk out there and do the sport. Not something that you could apply to everybody, but this is a major step up. There's a book out there you guys might want to take the time to read. It was written by a guy named Ken Beasley, and it's called The Perfect Match. And Ken Beasley maintains that your greatest performance could even come within defeat. But always as an athlete, focus on the performance, not on the outcome. Don't worry about if I'm going to win or lose. Worry about bringing your best. What are your three best techniques? Are you going to bring them? Can you stay in the moment and and apply those three techniques all night long without losing focus and deviating? And whatever your best match was, he maintains that the best thing that you can do is work backwards and write down what happened because life is going to change. The people you train with, the way you train, the way you prepare, some of the money, some of the fame. Sometimes you're the overdog, sometimes you're the underdog, sometimes you're the champion, sometimes you're the contender. Things are going to change and those can change you. So once you have the perfect match, go and write down what happened. How specifically did you warm up that day? How much sleep did you get the night before? What song, what music did you hear that day, if any? What conversations did you have? What did you wear? How did you comb your hair? Break down specifically what happened on the day when you had your perfect match and then duplicate it. 